So to Patrick's point, um, feel free to raise your hand at any point. I should be able to see it on the screen if you're raising your hand to ask a question. I don't mind at all um, because a lot of times the questions are really a lot easier to answer when we're looking at that information right in front of us. Um, so what we're going to cover today is going to be the regulatory updates for um, lithium ion batteries for the for 2024 as we are aware of them right now. Um, so let's see if I can get in the right place to click it. Maybe I can, maybe I can. There we go. All right. <laughs> so, oh, um, and I see there's my mistake already. Major changes in 20. Oh, um, so it, that's okay. What we're looking at are some of the things that happened in 2023 at the end of 2023, and then what's going on in 2024. So, some of the things that happened there was an eighth revised addition to the UN Manual of Tests and Criteria. CE marking for batteries came about, and it's got a very long span of timeline to it, and it's uh, it's somewhat complicated when you start looking at the various different product categories and types and how it's going to be implemented, and Emily will go into some information about that at the end. Um, one of the things we're not really going to cover in detail, but it is a big issue that's come up over the past year, is e-bike regulations, um, particularly in New York City, and what they're doing to address some of the e-bike fires and stuff that's going on. It's led to a lot of new regulation, and some of that regulation is going to have impact well beyond New York City, and so there's there's a need to be aware of it. So we do know that this is probably going to be one that a lot of you will have some questions about or may want to see more information about because it will have a broader impact than, than just New York City um, from what we're seeing. So I got to remember, I can't click my down button. <laughs> I can't click, but there we go. All right, I always like to start with what I'm going to cover and what I'm not going to cover because um, not that I won't answer questions about the things in the what I'm not covering, I'm just not going to be very focused on these during this call. And I would love to hear at the end if these are areas that you've got interest in learning more about because these are ones that um, they're different in the way that the regulatory compliance is applied. They follow some different paths and that, so they do require a little bit of a different presentation or a, a, a different set of knowledge. So if we were to go through all of these things that are on here, including the in and out of scope for this call, we would probably have a half day or full day event. Um, so since we've only got an hour, we're going to focus on small format portable um, use battery packs primarily lithium ion rechargeables where we're, we'll talk through some other things if the as the subject comes up potentially, but that's the focus. Um, safety compliance, so we're not going to really be looking at EMC. We're not going to be looking at chemical content, any of that kind of stuff. We will talk through with the CE marking. There's some, it, it's got a little bit broader impact or broader um, uh, span of, of requirements. And so there will be a little bit of discussion that goes beyond the safety because it's just such a comprehensive um, uh, compliance requirement that's coming into play. So I'm just going to start with the general path. So uh, I, I go over this a lot with people. Batteries aren't like everything else. Normally, if you have an end device, you can go out and you get an IEC report to an IEC standard, you get a CB certificate, you take that CB certificate to all these different um, regional organizations, and they will issue you their certification mark, um, which is a great, great way for doing things as long as you have that ability. What we find is batteries don't follow that. So batteries have a lot of interesting things going on with them. They're, they're somewhat of an end device, but they're not really. They're usually a component. And so... There's some battery specific standards that sit there. There's some battery specific regulations and requirements that sit there. But then there's also the end device standards, which in some cases can push back against the battery requirements and be slightly different um, or just cause a little bit of ambiguity of what's required because they may not align directly because they weren't created by the same groups or the organizations. So your end device standards and regulations are developed by those industry groups or those experts and your battery ones are developed by battery experts and the battery industry. So they may have been developed in, in silos, not talking to each other, mm -hmm. and so they don't always necessarily align and have to be taken into consideration. Additionally, because a battery is a component of a larger device in most cases, um, there, there comes this question of, well, I passed the battery standard, but there is an issue with the battery in the end device. So where does the responsibility lie to sort of address that or fix it? Um, so, so that's some of the things that make batteries somewhat different from your standard product, end product or device that would be out there. Um, 
It's just a little bit of a look at what what the forces are that are at play globally. So you either have stuff that falls into that that really nice clean scheme of IEC CB report acceptance. Um, you know, uh, below that you've got your harmonized in-country testing. So this means you're using an IEC standard or some kind of harmonized standard, but you have to test it in-country. Um, then you have your your non-harmonized in-country testing, which I, this this gets down that path a little further of it's not a harmonized standard and but I have to have in country testing I guess that's probably the 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 last bucket really but and then there's the non harmonized third party that's it's not a harmonized standard but you can submit a report that's done by any accredited third party and it'll be accepted um, so those are sort of your four buckets that it falls in and then everybody is probably aware there's always the underlying shipping requirements that are always there when it comes to battery packs that are going to be put into the shipping chain so any questions so far jerry's got his hand up oh so i can't see the hands up so um emily can you see the hands up and let me know if somebody's got their hand up I can. yeah okay thank you hey, jerry, please, you me, just a quick question for you i joined us a little bit late are, are you going to be able to share these slides with us? Yes. Yeah, okay. I will share so them. Um, and they're, slides. yep, and we're recording. So there'll be a recording afterwards that anybody on the call should actually have access to. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. No problem. All right. So th this is what's really required. And <laughs> I, I will say with a little bit of a caveat, it's yes, this is what's really required, but it all depends. So notice the last column there is what does it depend on? Um, because all of them are not always so straightforward that, hey, yeah, I'm going to South Korea. So I always have to have my cells and packs um, certified and it's mandatory, except for the things over in the depends column where it's not. So this is just kind of a quick overview of the different areas that we're going to cover today. So we're going to look at each of these in a, a one to two slide sort of um, overview of them, but just a kind of sort of a quick glance at what it what it looks like. Robin, did you have a question? Oh. Yeah, uh, this slide would be really great to get with yep. another column that goes across those four types of certifications you had. OK, OK, and I think actually Patrick um, has some of that information that he's been working on that starts to get into the types of certifications for each. So we can we can work on that along with this and see if we can do that. So thank you. Yeah, yeah no problem. Um, so shipping regulations. This one, I, I think everybody's aware of this. You know, dangerous good. All lithium ion batteries are are dangerous goods, hazardous materials. No matter what way you're shipping them, um, not much has changed here. I put the note at the bottom. There is the eighth edition. The changes in the eighth edition were really just to um, to integrate requirements for sodium ion batteries and a, a specific set just addressing of those. So really nothing has changed. Um, it's and I don't expect that the shipping regulations um, and testing are going to change much because they've been they changed a lot in the first several years they were out there and they've become fairly stable at this point. So I'm, I'm not really concerned about them changing much. I have a question. Yeah. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? I'm sure can. Eight, eight or sixteen for the UN DOT. Yep. Um, can you clarify the difference of why we would need or we're allowed to use two different set of numbers? Yeah, it depends on if you've got battery packs or if you've got cells and if they're large or small format. So if you're over twelve kilograms, there's going to be a reduced requirement for samples. Got it. Okay. Thank yep. you. Yep, and we can detail that. If you've got questions specific to that, just um, send them on to us and we can give you a chart. It, it, there's a chart that sits in the UN manual that goes through cells, um, single cell batteries, modules, and battery packs and shows you what number of samples you need for each of the tests. Now, th there is some ability to have some reuse as well. Um, it, if you run the tests in the right sequence and they aren't damaged at the end of either the overcharge or the short circuit, you could run overcharge and then one through five, or you could run one through five and then overcharge as long as the samples are still usable after that that Thanks. test that you're running sort of sequentially that was intended to be in parallel. Okay, great. That answers my question because we had yeah. a customer asking why we increased the 16. And they have a yeah, and you can, you can yeah. use eight even in the case where there where there's a requirement for sixteen, as long as you have samples that are still usable. So we could run the T eight test, which is the overcharge, wait the seven days, and then run T one through five, as long as they're still functional after T eight, and you and they aren't damaged to the point where you can't run the rest of the test. They recover. Or the this other option we've done is T one through five, 
and then T8, and then the seven-day seven wait. T7. I'm sorry. T7. Right. I'm sorry, Christina. T7. Thank you. I'm sorry. You're right. Got it. <laughs> but it's probably Christina. best to just stick with 16 because then that'll yeah, do it. it yeah. Well, okay. It's a high yeah, voltage have, battery, so we'll probably have to use 16. Yeah. So you probably, they probably aren't usable after you run overcharge. And so um, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's a risk. So it's a okay. risk and it's yeah. a timing issue. You add, you add a week and a half once you put the seven day wait in there. So okay. um, yeah, so there's risk that. involved. Okay. Thank yep. you. No problem. So I, I, have um, a, yeah. I, have a, I have one more question uh, oh, yeah. on that. I apologize here. And no, hey, hopefully Julie, it's not you? a st stupid I'm one, fine. but uh, I know you mentioned that one of the uh, additions is sodium ion cells, but um, is there any specific regulation tied to uh, the silicone anode uh, based cells? Not currently. I mean, I could, Emily, you want to speak to that one a little bit? Um, there are a couple of the standards that are looking into adding adjustments for, but right now there's no specific call out for any kind of a, additional or different testing. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so this is looking at 62281, and as a lot of you know, 62281 is really just an IEC version of the UN Manual of Testing Criteria with some additions to try and address the packaging and labeling requirements that sit in the um, in the shipping regulations themselves. It's not overly um, overly well utilized globally. It is most often utilized in some areas of China. So, um, but China will also then tie it to letters of approval for safe transport for the different modes of transportation that you're trying to go. Um, the current Amendment 2 doesn't align to the eighth edition yet. There's usually a lag of about um, 12 to 18 months to get the release of the UN document and then get that integrated into a an IEC uh, standard update. So now I'm going to kind of jump into the country. So looking at India, so I, the, uh, the format. Before you go on, could I just yep. uh, raise a small point here? So yep. when you say the UN testing hasn't changed, yeah, the, the UN testing is going to be stable because it really hasn't changed in years. Yep. But the marking and labeling requirements and state of charge requirements fall outside the testing requirements, right? Correct. Yeah, so those could change, but not the testing. Right, and and they've gotten fairly stable as well um, because there were a lot of changes to them over the past uh, or at the first five to set five to ten years of it. Um, but there is there always is a lot of discussion going on, particularly when you're seeing fires aboard ships and um, you're still seeing issues in transit that that have to be addressed. And as larger and larger products are being transported, you have the EV fires on ships is probably a big one that's out there. But the, that that whole discussion is also being fueled by the fact that you're seeing these e-bike fires in New York City and everybody knows that those are battery issues. And so they're they're carrying it the step back of, well, these things have to be transported too. what what can we do to to help with the transport being safer? And so that it's a it's a whole supply chain issue really on on how things are going to be packaged and what kind of controls are going to be in place. There's I always almost every meeting that goes on, there's always a discussion of should we mandate a third party certification for UN since it's all self-declared? And there's always a lot of pushback on that. But it's one of those things, every time it gets introduced, there's a little bit less and less pushback. So you just never, you're exactly right, that you never know when some of the um, the shipping regulations themselves are going to change. That That's kind of where where I would anticipate you're going to see most of the change, if, if you see any, not in the testing itself. It's, it's pretty well stabilized. So yep, um, that's it. Yep. No, you're fine. Um, for each of the countries, you're going to see a slide pretty much like this, um, trying to just basically have a um, a summary on a page with information. And so what we're trying to show is, is this a mandatory requirement? Are you required to have in-country testing? What are the specific standards that are applied? Um, what happens to the cell? You know, is there a separate certification for the cell or is it the cell? Is, is it covered with the battery pack? And that does vary on, on different areas. And um, <clears throat> do you have to have in-country representation? And that's something that some countries do have. Is there a mark associated with it? And what's the samples and timeline? And um, is there a factory audit that's required? So you'll see that same format. We try and show um, at the bottom what the basic process is. Is the you know one, two, three steps that you have to have, um, and then what the marks look like for it. And then um, 
on the right hand side, we're looking at what you need to be aware of. The, these are just historically speaking, you guys can probably add a million more things that you run into, but these historically speaking have been the common issues that we've seen um, as we've worked with these various different countries over time. So when when we're looking at India, India is coming a very long way. I, I remember the first year that we were doing India and you had to provide la, you know, layouts of your production line and, you know, all, uh, all kinds of things. And it took months and months to get stuff through. Um, now, India has become a much, much better area to work with. Um, but I will highlight the point that not all labs and um, local reps are equal. So you you kind of have to make sure that you've got a good group of people that you're working with for your in-country lab and your local authorized rep, because that really does determine how quickly this process goes and how smoothly it goes. Um, the surveillance part of it can be a little bit challenging um, and it can result in your loss of, of registration. Um, it's really most of what they're doing is they're actually rerunning the entire program when they're doing the surveillance to make sure everything still complies. Um, but as you can see, this one's mandatory. There is um, in-country testing requirement. The The standard is basically the, the um, Indian version of IEC 62133. Um, Unfortunately, they didn't number it that way. I wish they would have. Um, there is a separate registration required for the component cell, and that um, has to be finished before you can start the battery pack. So you can't do that a parallel path typically. Um, and then you do have to have the in-country representation um, and their lovely mark. And here's your sample counts. I did include nickel metal hydride on this because we do see some of those in, in our um, in our work that we're doing. So like I said, I, I break my own rules after I said that wasn't what we were covering at the beginning. <laughs> Cindy, important to note that we handle the lab and the representation. So yep. customers need not worry about that portion. Right. Yeah, we can provide both as part of the services that we have is it's it's seamless one one contact that you're dealing with with us. And we've we've developed really good relationships with um, the labs that we work with and with our um, authorized India rep has, has been really great. And so, yeah, we've got a really great relationship with them. Um, South Korea is an interesting one, and this one's one of those that you saw a lot of information on the Depends slide or the Depends column up there because of the fact that it's changed recently. and um, it's it's actually changed a couple of times in the past two years. Korea historically was was behind the IEC by one revision of the standard almost always. So you'll notice that the standard applied here is KC 62133-2020. Um, and they were trying to do the right thing. They released their new standard and they were trying to harmonize with what was being proposed in the IEC for the newest revision of the IEC standard, which we're sitting in 2024, and that still hasn't been released yet. So that's where some of the disconnect comes in between Korea and the IEC. Like I said, they were trying to do the right thing. They were trying to be ahead of the ball with uh, or ahead of the game with, with complying or, or aligning with the IEC standard. They ended up getting ahead of themselves and they've had a standard in place for four years and the IEC is still waiting to release theirs. Um, you can use a CB report. There's deviations that are out there, but you you really have to be very specific up front because some of the documentation um, and information that goes into the reports has to be well understood before we start the process because there's some things that are actually um, they're, they're different and they require a different route or a different documentation to get them taken care of. So it's it's best to know that you're going to need South Korea before we go into the process of starting a project. And um, so historically speaking, it was cells and battery packs. There were there were no exceptions and or there were very limited exceptions to that. Now there's there's um, a bigger gap. So if you it, it's there's an exemption for cells with voltages that are and that should say greater than um, 4.4 volts and an energy density. And I think I have both of my energy. I have I have my signs wrong on both of those, don't I? Um, so anyway, if it's 4.4 volts or an energy density of over 700 watt hours per liter, I'll fix that before I send these out. Um, and the cells uh, or cells sold commercially um, are considered to be battery packed. So it's a little bit different. You don't always have to have the cells approved. Um, and then they will take CB reports with those national deviations. So. <laughs> So Thailand, historically, I've only been able to say that we we are aware of what Thailand is, but we've not completed one because this one's a really, really convoluted process. Um, but I believe, Patrick, have we done, we've gotten one all the way through now? But the we're very close. 
we're very, we're close. very close. It's <laughs> we're at the factory inspection uh, phase, but uh, it's it's really important to note that this thing is going to take about 16 weeks, Thailand. Yeah. So if anybody needs it, uh, I would plan accordingly. Very good point. Um, so Thailand is um, it's based on your IEC standard. It does require the in-country testing. It's very difficult to get stuff um, into the country for the testing. And that's what you're going to see with a lot of these countries is getting the product in for testing is almost as hard as you know doing the testing and issuing actually probably harder than doing the testing and issuing the reports um and it really comes down to making sure that you've got really good knowledgeable contacts in the country that um that can help you get through all of this so um like i said there's a mark on this one um and like patrick mentioned it's a very long process and it does require that we have a factory audit done um and the factory audits are are typically fairly extensive um that, that they have in place so Japan or Danon compliance, Japan, um, Japan is one of those it's it's required, but it's not. It's it's a mandatory self declaration. Um, and so it, it, you're, it's mandatory to have the PSE mark and, and to meet the requirements, but it's a self declaration with a registration and the registration is completed by the importer of record. And so there's some requirements on the label that um, are specific to the importer. So if you had multiple importers, you would provide them with a compliance report. They would go and register as an importer of the product and, and affix their Japanese information specific to their company um, to the label. So um, Danon law now allows, so it used to be there was a Danon law. It had all the test requirements printed in as part of the law. They were somewhat aligned with IEC testing, but it was old revisions of the IEC testing and it was old JIS standards. Um, they now have JIS 62133-2. It is still very different, even though it's numbered IEC 62133 um, type of reference, it's still very, very different from the IEC standard because um, the national deviations have some requirements for the, te the uh, test prep steps. And so, this is one again it's got it's got to be known up front that you're going to do this because you can't just say oh can i just add the deviations for japan it's it's uh it's like yeah that'd be great we'll go rerun all the tests um, <laughs> because they have to be prepped at some various temperatures before the tests and so it requires a lot longer testing um in a lot of cases so it's a fun one so Emily's going to talk a little bit more about this one later, um, but the, the European Union, there's a new CE marking requirement and there's a defined um, timeline and there's six product categories. Is that what it is? Sorry. It's seven. 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 Gotcha. <laughs> yep. So the seven product categories, she'll touch on those, I think, at the end of this, but we're going to focus mainly on the um, uh, portable for this. But the plan is to have some different of information available about the other six product categories um, and what their timelines look like. Um, <clears throat> so it is it is self declared. Um, it is mandatory. The difference. So the biggest difference initially, particularly for the um, small format, is really just the ability to to use that CE mark. So the the old standards were not CE marking standards. The new ones are. Um, there's other directives and standards that may be able to be applied as well. So I think everybody's aware of the old battery directives that have the chemical content recycling capacity information. Um, the EMC directive and Patrick Patrick can probably talk ad nauseum about EMC directive and when to apply it for, um, for battery packs and when not. Um, and then there's your end device standards, like I mentioned at the beginning, your, the ITE standard 62368 um, will have some specific requirements for the battery packs. And particularly if you tested the battery packs to um, 62133, there's a section in Annex M of 62368, which I love the number jumble, um, that has requirements of the battery in the, tested with the host device. So uh, just some some different things to be aware of there. Um, it's, it's not... It, does somebody have a question? Nope. Okay. All right. So UK, um, UKCA is something that has come up in the past few years, and it was you know, based on Brexit. Um, and what we've seen happen is kind of what we thought would happen here. There'll be a set of the BS standards that get applied. They'll be equivalent to the IEC standards, and they'll really just follow suit with the um, 
uh, with the European Union for their implementation of requirements. But they do require a separate mark, even though they follow the same rules as the European Union. Um, currently, UKCA does not have an equivalent to the new CE marking requirement that Europe has. I expect that they'll come into line in the in the next year or so. And that's typically how it works. Um, but the um, the battery marking is voluntary, not mandatory at this point. So, all right, um, Eastern Eastern Europe. So there's Russia, and then there's the um, the EAC certification, so the European Customs Union. <clears throat> so Russia, of course, is Russia only. The um, the Eurasian Customs Union includes Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. And I hope I pronounced all of them right. Um, the for for Russia, it is just safety requirements. Um, for for the Euro for the Eurasian Customs Union, there's addition of EMC. It very much mirrors the um, the CE marking requirements for Europe um, in their old form, not the new form yet. Again, they'll probably adopt the same similar requirements to what the European Union does, but it'll probably take them another year, year and a half to do it. Um, so I'm going to go into a little more detail about the Russian requirements. <clears throat> so Russia is another one that there's probably there's probably not a lot of demand for it right now, given um, trade situations. But if it is something that's needed, the standard follows IEC 62133. Um, there's no longer an, an MOU or CB acceptance, unfortunately. Um, and but there is sort of a, a relationship with the um, Eurasian Customs Union, and it does require the EMC even for dumb batteries, which is interesting. I'm not really sure what you see in an EMC report for that, but. Uh, and you will definitely have trouble shipping samples into Russia currently, um, as they are probably on a lot of companies do not do business with list. So you just have to be kind of aware of that going into it if you if you really have a need. China, um, China falls into that that bucket of we have our own standard and you have to test in country with us. Um, so and, and it's also a little bit confusing because, um, well, I, I guess it's it's kind of been cleared up a little bit. So in March of 23, which is, I think, what, like two days after I did my presentation last year and somebody asked me about this one at the presentation. Um, but on in March of last year, they announced that they were going to implement a compulsory certification requirement for lithium ion batteries. And, and some other products. They did that, um, but it's only for some limited applications. So it's it's for component parts that have um, the CCC and CQC separately. So um, it, it's, it's a little bit limited. So that one, we would have to look at it individually. It's predominantly on your 3C type of items. So your consumer electronics type stuff is where they're looking at it which honestly was where they were before, but they didn't have it as a mandatory or a compulsory or CCC mark required on the battery pack. They required that the end device manufacturers provided proof of testing. Um, that typically at that point was done either through a trusted report or a, um, uh, a trusted letter if you were exempt from the requirements. Now it does require that you have the CCC mark and the CCC um, separate certification to do it. And it does require a factory inspection. The U.S. This is um, sort of everybody's favorite, I think, um, because it's it's voluntary, but it's in device driven. So I know a lot of people when I say voluntary, like whoa, 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 that's that's required. I'm like, mm, it's required for you um, because your in device manufacturer is requiring it, or your installation application is requiring it. Um, technically speaking, there is currently not a mandate for any um, U.S. marking on a um, a battery. Now, again, your mileage may vary on that because um, local authorities having jurisdiction can require it for installations, um, and we are seeing a big change in that with the um, the New York City requirements for the e-bike stuff is going to drive a, a potential for uh, third party certification requirements on battery packs as, as a much larger sort of impact. Um, there's a lot of different options for standards too. So the US one gets very, very confusing. Is it required? Is it not? What standard do I apply? Do I apply? Because there's UL 1642, there's UL 2054, there's UL 62133-2. What what works? What applies? Um, 
1642, while it's called the standard for lithium ion batteries, is actually only applied to cells. And so it's going to be your most accepted standard globally, even for lithium ion cells. Um, it's it's just there's almost every cell supplier, if they're a reputable cell supplier, is going to have UL1642 on their cells. Um, UL also has 62133-2 that you can apply to cells. And um, then at the battery pack level, the, the main standards that apply out there are going to be UL2054, which is an older standard, um, much harder to comply with. It makes the assumption that the battery pack is a standalone unit and you don't know how it's gonna get used in the end device. And so there's some very stringent testing as Christina will probably, she could tell you ad nauseum about uh, some of the stuff that she has to do. Um, but there's a lot of requirements to fault the batteries and then operate them, the, operate them below the trip points of the faulted circuits, which is a very, very stringent test, especially when you compare that to UL1640, or sorry, 62133 testing, which is as received condition. There might be some prep that has to go on to charge or discharge them at temperature or in certain settings, but you're typically not going to be faulting your devices or your batteries for the testing in that case. So, um, what determines whether you do UL2054 or UL6213-2 um, is really going to be your in-device application. Um, so if you're if you're going into a product that's ITE, Pro AV, medical device, um, you're you're most likely going to get thrown into UL2054, or you're going to have some significant additional testing that you have to do. Um, but internationally, you're going to want to do IEC 6133 because that's what the end device is going to get a CB report for. So, um, or it's going to require as part of their CB report. So, if you're in certain product categories, you end up doing sort of dual testing where you're testing to the IEC standard. Um, if you have the opportunity to stay with with UL 62133. It's a much cleaner path. It's a much lighter set of tests, um, and it's more, you know, globally accepted. However, there are a number of UL in device standards that do not allow for 62133, the UL version of it yet. They only allow for UL 2054. Um, one thing to note is about three years ago, OSHA did add um, battery standards to its list of approved standards, but there, we haven't really seen much happen because of that. There were three, there were three standards that were added and UL 2054 was one of them. And there was a lot of discussion on what that would mean for workplace type things like your laptop, you know, was that going to all of a sudden make, um, it laptops that, that were in the workplace required to have, um, UL 2054. I think the bigger concern was everybody, everybody has their little portable computers with them at their desk these have batteries in them um, and these are used in the workplace fairly regular. Are these now going to fall under OSHA's scope for workplace um, equipment and require that they meet a standard like UL 2054, which typically they don't have a third party certification on them right now. No, we haven't seen any movement in that, which is good. Um, so just something to be aware of. It sits out there. Um, there's always that opportunity for, for OSHA and um, other agencies to come in and, and point to that and say, hey, that's a workplace violation. So um, I don't think they'll do it. They got much better stuff to work on, but you never know. Um, Taiwan BSMI, this one's one that is very much driven by the end device. So if you're in, it's, it's based on HS shipping codes. Um, and if you're in any of those categories, um, the computer communication and consumer electronics, that's the 3C I was referring to earlier, um, or you have a power bank. Um, those are the areas where you're gonna see requirements in place. Um, and this one does require, or Patrick, correct me if I'm wrong here. Does this one require in country? Yep, in country testing is required for, for Taiwan. Um, we do have, I think this is one where we do have an agreement with um, UL Taiwan, um, but I think it still requires that the, the testing be done at UL Taiwan. Um, it can't be done at, at our location and accepted. So, all right. I'm not going to go into great detail on these. We we don't see a lot of need for these, and and the reason being is um, the way that their certification schemes are set up. They don't necessarily lend themselves to the battery packs needing to be separately tested or have a certification. So you know Malaysia has a type of appro approval process. Um, it's typically done. You can get a batch approval per shipment based on a CB report, and so there's not really a need to have that a certification mark. Um, 
you know, you'll you'll see a couple of these that that have something similar. There's also some of them that they do the testing at the end device when it comes in, and they just take the CB reports for the battery packs as a component. So. I'm going to turn it over to Emily to start talking CE marking, but if anybody's got any questions, feel free to raise your hand before we get into that if you want to, and, and we can hit that. Perfect. Maury? Hi, I have a quick question. Um, do you cover Turkey? <laughs> that is a really good question, actually, and Patrick could could probably answer that one, but yeah, we do cover Turkey, and but it's mainly chemical content requirements that are required in Turkey. Okay, thank you. And uh, quickly, and also, uh, accessories for batteries such as charger or adapters yep so that's one of the really nice things about the acquisition with element is we now have a broader resource um, pool to cover chargers um, and power supplies in addition to the battery pack so yeah we we definitely have the ability to do that okay thank you so much yeah all right i'm gonna turn it over to emily and be quiet now <laughs> <laughs> that's okay feel free to interrupt me so I'm going to be going over the CE marking and Cindy and, and Steve Hayes, who is our um, CE expert over in Europe, has been helping us really understand what the CE marking and the directives, what the impact is going to be. So I had a couple quick facts here that I think might be important to kind of set the tone and explain what their focus is with this directive. So the first thing is it's the 2023 and then the 1542. There was a previous directive from 2006, and that will still kind of be in play a little bit. There is a little bit of overlap between the 2023 directive and the 20 or 2006 directive. And they're going to they're basically trying to phase out the 2006 directive with this new one. So the biggest thing for me when I was looking through this directive is especially with the type of testing that we do here in our lab, my focus is a lot on performance testing, safety testing, abuse. This directive is mainly to focus on environmental impacts. So whether that's looking at collection points, labeling for consumers, replaceability, and it does have some um, content on performance and durability testing of batteries, which I'll get into a little bit more but the main focus is on the environmental impact and how they can reduce waste. So the biggest thing is going to be that the CE marking does need to be applied to batteries mentioned in the directive. And the date which that goes into effect is um, eight, August 18th of this year. Um, but the requirements needed to put the CE marking vary depending on what battery and what articles go into effect. So in the case of portable batteries, you need to start putting it on your battery August 18th of this year, but the requirements to do so don't really come into effect until 2026. And I think that's the key is that there's a couple of administrative tasks that need to be done beforehand. A lot of that is going to be registering the product um, obligations with distributors, but no new testing or any kind of different requirements go into effect until 2026. So on the next slide, I have um, the description. So Cindy mentioned it before, but there's seven different types of batteries mentioned in this directive. Um, there is some overlap between the two. The main one we're gonna be focusing on today is portable batteries, which they describe as a battery that is sealed, weighs five kilograms or less, and is not designed specifically for industrial use or neither an electrical vehicle LMT battery and our SLI battery. And they have what LMT is light means of transport, and then SLI is starting lighting and ignition battery. And they have descriptions of what they consider each of these here. Now, they do have a portable battery of general use description, which I'm not gonna be going into too much today because they are slightly different. There is a bit of overlap. Um, there is overlap for portable and LMT batteries, especially there's a couple of the articles that link them up together. Um, but for the most part, this is going to be self declared. So if you read through these descriptions and your battery fits into a particular category and the use case lines up, that is what you're going to propose your battery is going to fall into. And on the next slide, I have the timeline of the portable batteries. So these initial articles, the 55, 62, 67, 66, and so on, those were the kind of administration 
ar articles I was mentioning before. There also are some that are rollovers from the 2006 directive. And that one is particularly the case for this one here that went into effect of December of 2023, Article 59, Collection of Portable Batteries. That is in reference to a requirement in the 2006 directive, which I believe was 45% collection of what they consider portable batteries by the uh, by December 2023. So they kind of rolled that over into the new directive. You'll see here there's a massive gap between 2024 and 2026, so there's kind of not a lot going on. Um, I need to make a marker on this timeline for the August um, 18th cutoff for having the CE marking on batteries, because I think that's going to be important to have on there. Now, the first one that goes into effect is Article 69. And that's really just for member states on collection targets, what they're going to be looking at. But the following directives, that's kind of when after uh, 2026, that's when everything starts happening in a pretty good sequence. So you're going to see a lot of these on labeling and marking. The removability and replaceability is an interesting one. So depending on the use case of the battery, you may or may not need to meet that requirement. They do have certain um, exceptions listed throughout the directive. And I think this removability and replaceability is going to be a sticking point with a lot of people because that will require um, either access by a technical personnel to get inside your in your product and access the battery for replacement or fixing. Um, and I don't believe they called out specifically consumers to be able to do this. The exception for Article 11 is that if your battery, if you can show that it's used in water. So if it needs to be sealed completely and if it's unsealed to get into it, if that would compromise the integrity of your battery, you can get out of it. So that's just an example of one of the exceptions um, going through here. But if you, if anyone on the call has more questions on specifics of these articles, um, please let me know. And the other thing that we're working on right now is summaries of each of the different types of batteries and timelines for each of them. So that way you can kind of go on to our website or we can either distribute the list and that way you'll have a very easy access to what the timeline is going to be, what specific articles are going to be in fact and what you need to look for. Um, but as I kind of mentioned in the beginning, there's not too many changes to performance and durability requirements. The biggest one that I noticed was not for portable batteries, but it was for energy storage systems. So the new requirement for energy storage systems, and this is a couple years off, so no, no one freak out now, uh, but I'll have to make sure, but it, it does require gas analysis during propagation. It's very reminiscent of UL 9540A, um, but that's pretty much the only big change that I've seen that they would you know, have a requirement for additional testing that may not be covered in, in a current standard that they prefer. Um, but feel free if anyone has any questions or comments to let us know. Right. So, um, any questions? That's the yeah, I switch slide. There we go. <laughs> we finished early. <laughs> well, I wanted to. I, I I was almost on for the fifteen minutes of, of Q and A. So, um, anybody have any questions? I like doing them as we go through. I think it's better. So, um, but do do feel free to reach out to any of us if you. Uh, oh, so Steve. I just want to say this is Paul from Inventus. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, we've used you many times. Used you many times uh, every year. You guys are exceptional. Very nice job. Keep doing what you're doing, and uh, thank you. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, great talk, Cindy. Um, cool. I, I, lo I love the fact that you're you touched on the fact that certain countries are not necessarily harmonized to the current version of the standard and are following some other version, which <laughs> which makes it so difficult, right? Yes, it it's, uh, <laughs> makes it very painful. Yeah. And uh, the other one that makes it painful is when they don't even necessarily follow their same thing 
for everything that they do. Um, you know, so it, it's just, Korea is very, very confusing. And I know Patrick and, and Glenn have spent a huge amount of time really figuring out what's going on in Korea. And um, Element did just acquire a battery lab in Korea um, about eight or nine months ago, and we're, we're working on getting integrated with them. And so we'll have a lot more direct knowledge in that area, um, which has been good. But yeah, the, some of these are really, they're, they're Crazy convoluted. You wouldn't think it would be that hard. It's it's a battery, and there's only a handful of standards. <laughs> yes. Yep. Steve, hey, Jerry. You... Oh. Robert. Yeah, uh, I just had a couple of questions. Uh, I've been working with Glenn. This is Robert from iTech, uh, <laughs> uh, and I've been working with Glenn on a lot of the requirements for simplified and traditional Chinese between. Um, China and Taiwan mm -hmm. is if if that language needs to be on the labels, um, could you add that to your slides? I will. I will. I'll get with Glenn and um, and update that because that's a that's a good point. Where we try, yeah, because we're trying to in that one box really put in there. Hey, th these are things you really need to understand before you submit your product and really finalize all of your stuff because these these can. I mean, I I know it sounds simple and so I just change your label. Yeah, I've been on the other side of that. I know what that looks like. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Yeah, because it seems like the the new CC requirements they're they're requiring a lot of verbiage that. A lot of other companies are not doing so. Okay, I'll make sure I get an update from Glenn on on that one, and we'll update the slide with it. Thanks. Yeah, no, I appreciate you bringing that up. Actually, Jerry, hey, did you? Have a yeah, Cindy. Um, a little outside of the scope, but touches on a little bit. I know years ago people did mail pin, kind of going away, and a couple of countries are doing forced internal short. Do you see any direction for any other test or? I know it's yeah. a big topic, but can you comment on that? No, no, no. It's a really good topic. And what I would really like to see happen is the new revision of the IEC standard get released because yeah. um, and, and everybody's seen all these drafts from it. And every we were all really excited because in, in 2020, this thing was going to get released and there's going to be more options besides the forced internal short circuit right. for for simulating that, that situation. And they were allowing for the use of x-ray and, um, and physical teardowns in place place of doing a forced internal short circuit, which which has repeatability issues. And I don't have a good date still. They have not put out. Um, my understanding from talking to a couple of different people is in 2024, there's supposed to be another minor revision that comes out that corrects some more of the grammatical errors and things that were out there and inconsistencies. But it probably will actually even be 25 or later before that revision comes out. Now, some of the larger format stuff, the 62619 and 62620s, they allow for that stuff already. Um, but they have not, nobody's written a decision. And I don't know if anybody's actually even submitted a request for a decision to the IEC to say, hey, this is already being used in other standards. Can we use this in the IEC standard world or you know, the 62133 standards world now? Because it would be a huge help. There's so many different applications where the force internal short just doesn't make sense. Um, and I know we've had a lot of conversations about that and and how do you justify that it doesn't make sense given your construction yep yep okay yeah and it's it's a problem <laughs> thanks yeah and then steve did you have another question or did some george or steve either one yeah steve here yep um nice job i appreciate it uh we're a new customer and we're happy to be with you Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. George. Yeah, the, the question on New York City and the e-bike. Do you know what will happen or what what do you expect to happen out of that? Is that going to creep into all batteries coming into New York City? Any thoughts on what might happen there? Yeah, so right now, and Emily, you can correct me because you've been on a couple more of these calls than I have, but right now I believe that they're only calling for third-party certification um, for e-bike 
applications. And it is focused actually on the end device more so than the battery pack. So there's um, there's light electric vehicle e-bike standards out there, and that's what they're looking at. But those then revert back to some battery requirements at the battery level. But um, the state of New York was looking at implementing something similar to what New York City was doing, but they took the step of taking it to all lithium ion batteries. So there was a ton of pushback, a ton of industry response to it. Um, that was in the middle of last year. I have not seen what's going on with that, but that was the concern is exactly what you're saying is that as as everybody sees what goes on in New York City, there's going to and, and if they if there's areas um, in large cities where you keep seeing these e-bike fires and issues going on, because that's really where they're they're focused is the, the big cities and the, um, you know, very tight geographic areas and, and large populations in, in small and in small areas. Um, that's where they're focused more is these big cities putting in regulations. But as that spreads, it's going to be states and then it's going to be, um, you know, looked at for just various different applications. And so I, I don't know where it's going to end up. Um, I hope it doesn't carry out beyond the e-bike standards and in device driven, but there is a little bit of push. Emily, go ahead. Yeah, I can jump in there. We've luckily been able to talk directly with some New York City firefighters before and kind of the who's kind of working behind that legislation. And one bit really big thing that they do realize is a lot of these fires are caused by people that are modifying the batteries themselves that are making their own and then these large charging facilities. So before I spoke to them, I didn't realize how extensive the charging facilities were. So you can basically they have rental programs so people will drop off a battery and then they can drive by and swap it up with another one so you have buildings with hundreds of e-bike batteries stored and they're just kind of they're daisy chain plugged into the wall like it's a lot of fire code violations going on so they recognize that good suppliers are not the problem here it's consumer awareness and then bad actors. So I would be shocked with them knowing that if they kind of bleed into different spaces with the with expanding it to different batteries, because I think their focus area right now is just kind of cracking down on these looser. Um, it's easier to get away with a poor made e-bike battery. I think it was something that they understand, which I was very happy to hear. Yeah, and historically, that's kind of where the, where it's always been. That we've we've all been through the um, the uh, oh, what was it? The scooters a few or the um, the hoverboards a few years ago, yeah. and and there there was a big problem with that. And it was it came back to bad actors and and poor charging, and even transportation stuff. The the shipping requirements they tend to change not because you guys are all following the rules, doing what you're supposed to do, and and packaging them, testing them, and and labeling them correctly. It's the people who are skirting the rules and creating a bad environment for everybody who's following because it's all still a lot of this is all still self-declared and so that's why they're starting to look at some of these third-party um uh, marking requirements a little stronger which we've been able to push it off in in the past but it's getting harder and harder great thank you very much yeah no problem uh, when will you be able to send the slides to us um, I want to make a couple of updates, but probably early next week, if that's okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. And I'm just going to do it to this distribution. I'll, I'll probably try and put everybody in BCC so that it's not giving out everybody's emails to everybody. <laughs> but if you do have questions, Emily's information is up there. I think a lot of you have mine. Um, it follows the same format, cindy.millsaps at element.com. Um, but um, we will get you answers if you have questions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Cindy. All right. Thank, oh, cool. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Carlos, I'll hang on for a Bye. second. You hang on and I'll. Oh, <laughs> sure. So this is Carlos Gonzalez. I'm with Custom Power. And I just yeah. want to send a plug your way to say thank you because it's great <laughs> working with your team. Uh, we love uh, you guys and just appreciate all you do. Thank you for all oh, this information. Uh, there's a lot and there's definitely um, a lot to it. So we appreciate your expertise. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, I take care. It. All right, you Have too. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.